Questions concerning upgrades are one of the more frequent messages we receive at Red Gaming Tech, and those questions are typically revolving around whether a graphics card will be bottlenecked with the user's current choice of CPUs. So in this first of a series of videos, we're going to be tackling that very question, pushing a GTX 1080 and GTX 1080 tie across different resolutions with a Coffee Lake i7 8700 processor with varying processor configurations. Before we begin, I'd like to thank MSI for sending over the i7-8700 along with the B360 Gaming Pro Carbon Motherboard. Do know that this is not a sponsored video, but still it is kind of them to send it over, and a review of the motherboard will also be found in the video description once it is done, so please go ahead and check that out. I'd also like to extend our thanks to you as the viewer because without your support and viewership, videos like this would not be possible. So a little about the tests then. We're running a GeForce GTX 1080 Ti and a GeForce GTX 1080 graphics card with different resolutions of 1080p, 1440p and finally 4K. We also take the popular i7-8700 processor and play around the core count and thread count by manipulating both hyper-threading and active processor core counts to see how games respond and run various titles including Vulcan DirectX 12 and DirectX 11. For system specs then, well, we are running the Intel i7-8700 with different CPU configurations, the MSI B360 Gaming Pro Carbon Motherboard, a NVIDIA GTX 1080 and GTX 1080 Ti, Crucial Ballistics 3000 MHz RAM running at 2666, Kingston SSD and Crucial MX300 750GB SSD for Windows and games respectively, Windows 10, which is patched to the latest version, and games, of course, patched to their respective latest versions. Of course, it goes without saying that in an ideal world, you'd choose the very best processor you could in relation to the fastest GPU on the market. But looking to the current console generation for a moment, and it shows that game engines are designed to push a disproportionate load onto the GPU. The AMD Jaguar CPU cores, which run from a modest 1.6 GHz to 2.3 GHz, lack both the clock speed and IPC of any slightly modern desktop uh, CPU. But even so, more cores and threads do enable games to load faster and supply more instructions to the GPU. One of the key distinguishing features Intel uses to separate its product lineup is hyperthreading, which allows two threads to run on a single CPU core. Taking the i7-8700 as an example then, its six physical cores are able to run 12 threads, and the i5-8600 lacks the hyperthreading support of its bigger brother and is capable of just six threads thanks to the six physical cores. We've already investigated the impact of SMT on and off on a Ryzen rig. You can find links to that in the video description, but we can quickly see that while some games, particularly the lower resolutions of the GTX 1080 Ti, certainly do seem to benefit from hyperthreading, for example, Ash of the Singularity, and other games just don't seem to offer the same experience and can actually have subtle FPS dips with hyperthreading enabled. The reason behind this does depend upon the game and appy, but the game engine may not properly be managing a large number of threads or two threads sharing the same execution resources of a single core is a negative. Hyperthreads do share thread cache and other resources of the single CPU core, but if a game doesn't respond well to hyperthreading, the impact is pretty marginal. And it's important to remember that this is a benchmarking rig. By this we mean we're not streaming, we're not running multiple background applications such as web browsers, chat applications or anything else for the sake of consistent results. This does mean that in reality, small performance gains you might receive in a few games by disabling hyperthreading may certainly be cancelled out or reduced by other applications de demanding their pound of flesh from CPU resources. Hyperthreading though does make a difference in CPU bound situations, and as we go down the number of physical cores, its absence is sorely missed. Four physical cores with hyperthreading performance is fairly close to that of six real cores in many games, and performance of just two cores enabled on our i7-8700 is made considerably better with the addition of SMT. Generally speaking, frame rates will be bound by one of two components inside a computer. The first being CPU bound, where additional threads and clock speed will make the difference, or the GPU, where typically resolution reigns supreme, and by adjusting resolution you can vastly affect the performance of the game. 
If you're running at lower resolutions with a GTX 1080 Ti or similar GPU, and your CPU isn't pushing the amount of threads or performance required, then frame rates in games such as Hitman, or even Batman Arkham Knight, which is running in DirectX 11, certainly do suffer. But for these games, the increase of resolution soon acts to cap FPS to roughly similar performance across all but the lowest number of available cores. Of course, higher core counts definitely help with loading times, for example, and help smooth out jitters when lots of explosions and assets are streamed in and other tasks which hammer the CPU, such as physics. But generally speaking, as long as you have a reasonable number of cores, you're probably good. Let's investigate further using Rise of the Tomb Raider and manual runs through two specific areas of the game. The first being the opening serial level, and then the infinitely more CPU taxing geothermal valley. Series opening is pretty simple, with lots of simple terrain and lower draw distances. As the map progresses though, things become more complex in the distance, and physics effects start to become more pronounced. But overall, this is one of those areas where CPU performance isn't a big deal. The results are actually very similar to what we found in our Ryzen mode testing video, once again linked in the video description. Geothermo Valley though, well this is a totally different beast. For a start, there's a large number of NPCs, lots of physics effects and huge amounts of foliage, trees, water and rocks and other terrain. The engine is constantly streaming in new assets and drawing in extreme distances to fill out the lusher terrain. Extreme resolutions, there's less in it between the number of CPU threads with 4K pushing even the GTX 1080 Ti near breaking point, but lower resolutions or extremely low number of threads will make for a jerkier and less enjoyable experience. Rather amusingly though, Rise of the Tomb Raider is playable at just a single CPU core with two threads albeit. It's not the best of experiences and that's an understatement and the title does crash if you try to run it in DirectX 12 mode with such few threads but you can get a passable experience with DirectX 11. Other than an interesting experiment, you could possibly make a case that you might opt to do this if you want to use most of your CPU cores for, say, video encoding or 3D rendering, and using your GPU for just a single core for gaming. A similar result can also be achieved in Doom 2016 with low numbers of threads. Its software have managed to optimize the id Tech 6 engine to impressive levels. Indeed. With just a single CPU core active and a single thread, it is possible to propel enough data to the GTX 1080 Ti to frequently hit the 60 FPS mark in 4K using OpenGL Renderer. Of course, the reality is that a large number of threads is definitely the way to go. At 1080p, using just four physical cores, we managed to virtually lock to 200 FPS, which is the engine's limit, at 1080p. With just two cores and four threads, we still managed to lock at over 150 to 170 FPS quite damn frequently. At resolutions of 1440p or higher though, often the GPU just can't manage to hit the 5ms render budget to achieve 200 FPS, and we often see dips at to high 170s, even if we have all cores enabled. At 4K, which is asking the graphics card to push four times the resolution of just rendering at 1080p, and it's clear that the GTX 1080 tie here is the bottleneck. It's clear that with Doom, if the GPU is not the limiting factor, at least four processor cores, ideally with hyperthreading, is the way to go. But when resolutions come into play, just two physical cores and four threads, thanks to hyperthreading, are sufficient. Indeed, the game's Kadir Sanctum does often peak at 200 FPS despite these limiting factors. And Kadir Sanctum is one of the more hectic areas of Doom, serving as the midway point of the game's campaign. We also have Gears of War 4, which is a very interesting title indeed. Built with DirectX 12 in mind on both the Xbox One as well as the PC, we have two distinct methods of testing. The first is using the game's built-in benchmark, which rather nicely does tell us the percent of the benchmark which is GPU bound. Obviously lower percentages indicates that the CPU is a culprit, while vice versa is also true. And we also have a series of manual runs. Just like everything else, we've adjusted the number of processor cores available, along with, of course, the resolution. The takeaway with Gears 4 is that six or more threads, be they physical or courtesy of Intel's hyperthreading technology, are enough to feed even the mighty 1080 Ti almost constantly with data, dropping to four physical threads and there's a performance penalty, but it's still a pretty decent experience. 
four physical cores and four physical threads though, well, performance certainly gets a kick in the shin. What's clear is that even two processor cores are enough to keep the game at over 60 FPS. And you might think that this is a feature of the benchmark being merciful. But no, it's similar in actual gameplay. With manual runs, we hit low mid 40s and an average of over 80, with lower numbers of cores. Switching to additional cores though quickly pushed the lows way above 60 and even 100 FPS. To simplify results and our takeaway, when it comes to extra threads, a little goes a very, very long way. Much like Rise of the Tomb Raider, Doom, and pretty much every other title tested here, resolution soon began to eat into performance. Gears at 1440p didn't see much change as long as there were four threads available, although the low points of FPS would definitely dip, and loading and asset streaming was slower. At 4K, well, the 1080 Ti barely hit over 60 FPS, and once again there were dips into 40s with only a few threads active. As for Final Fantasy XV, well I can say that 4 cores will push over 100 FPS when just running around the world map, so if you're concerned of 60 FPS or more with your new GPU, just don't be. So, more conclusions can we draw then? What's clear is, if you're looking to drive multiple GPUs with a high refresh rate, then of course, more CPU cores such as an i7-8700 are certainly the way to go. For people considering just a single GPU though, such as even the GTX 1080 Ti, and I suspect even the 1180, assuming that it doesn't offer incredibly improved performance over the current generation of GPUs, then even at mid-range resolutions such as 1440p will typically be GPU bound unless you have a very small number of threads available. If you're the owner currently of a 6600 or a 7600K or similar, and you're looking to push high refresh rates on a lower resolution, for example a GTX 1080 Ti class GPU, then without question upgrading to a higher performance CPU, for example the 6700K or the 7700K, could be a good way to save your budget. On the other hand, of course, better performance would be found by doing a full system upgrade, but that of course really depends upon your budget. With that said, if you're looking to crank the resolutions as high as possible, then most likely you will be often be CPU bound, particularly on a GTX 1080 or lower class GPU. But certainly, we would advise if you do have the budget available, do feel free to upgrade to a 6700 as they are coming down relatively quickly on eBay in terms of pricing. The larger number of threads will make gameplay experiences smoother. You will see a better average frame rate, a better lower frame rate, and generally speaking loading times and so on will be definitely faster. So if you do have the funds available, we would advise it, but for now at the very least, four physical cores, preferably with hyperthreading, will be absolutely fine with a GTX 1080 and possibly even a GTX 1080 Ti, providing that you are cranking up the resolutions as much as possible. So what's our advice here then? If you are running a GTX 1080 Ti, quite frequently you will be GPU bound on games such as Gears of War 4 and Final Fantasy 15, even at just 1080p. Therefore, going from four physical cores with eight threads to six cores and 12 threads, most likely you're not gonna see any real difference unless you are pushing streaming or you're really running a high refresh rate screen, running lots of background tasks, in which case your minimum FPS could see a marginal improvement. If on the other hand, you are pushing the resolution even more, then most likely it's not gonna be that much of a difference. But if you're running a slower CPU, for example, a 6600K, which just has four physical threads available, and you are gonna be upgrading to a GTX 1080 or GTX 1080 Ti, then I would highly advise you upgrade your CPU to a 6700K if those minimum FPS are of importance to you. But of course, it really comes down to your budget. The long and short of it is, if you happen to have a sixth generation Skylake processor, preferably the i7 with the hyper-threading, you're probably going to be good for at least one to two more years uh, with a GTX 1080 Ti or equivalent GPU. But of course we will be doing much further testing over the next several months, uh, particularly when the next generation of cards come out, and we'll also be testing with older uh, CPU architectures as well. 
So of course, if you want that type of information, then feel free to check us out. And that brings us to the end of the video. If you've enjoyed it, well, please click the subscribe button. And thanks very much for all of your recent support. It is greatly appreciated. You can also find our Patreon linked in the video description. Do know that we don't expect a donation or anything like that, but if you choose to, we would be greatly appreciative. And every single dollar that you do give us does enable us to produce better quality videos and of course afford better equipment and bring you the best coverage possible. But if you can't afford to do so or just choose not to, just by clicking the like button, just by commenting, subscribing, watching us is very appreciated. And do know that we value your time and um, we just are incredibly grateful for any support you give us at all. So thanks very much. With all of that said, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.